Well, we're going to take a look at a couple topics in this video. We're going to come back to this problem that we set up the last time and go over its uh, solution. Remember, we we you're you're at at an archaeological ex excavation and you're trying to find uh, volcanic walls that might outline the community, the area, the occupied area. And uh, so we're trying to decide whether we can actually detect this wall using magnetics. So we'll come back and talk about this problem. And remember we got this relationship here for, refer to that as a wall or a truncated sheet or, um, uh, you know, I think in this case it's, we're talking about finding a wall. We'll also talk about another simple geometrical object, and that is going to be the magnetic field intensity over a long vertical cylinder. And we'll leave you with a problem to solve. Okay, so <clears throat> what did you come up with? What anomaly did you predict that you would see over this wall? Well, all the details are laid out here for you. But just, just as a reminder, we have a volcanic wall which has a relative susceptibility of 0 0.001 CGS units, and these are dimensionless units, and uh, relative to the enclosing sediments, and we've just let that susceptibility equal zero. And we have a magnetizing field strength. The Earth's main magnetic field in this area is 55,000 nanoteslas. <clears throat> And the idea, again, is to determine whether the wall can actually be detected uh, using a proton precession magnetometer. So to do this problem, we have these two angles. Uh, <clears throat> we calculate theta 1 over 2 is just the inverse tangent of 0.5 meters over side opposite over side adjacent. So one 0.5 meters here, so 0.5 over 1.5, and theta 2 over 2, half the angle theta 2 as 0.5 over 2, which would be the distance from the point of observation down to the base of the wall. So we get these two angles in radians, 0.322 and 0.245. These two angles of theta then are multiplied by 2 since um, We've calculated theta 1 over 2 and theta 2 over 2. We have to multiply by 2. So the angles theta 1 and theta 2 are 0.644 and 0.49. So coming back to this expression, which we derived, and we're just kind of plugging in. We're just plugging in those angles and carrying out a very simple calculation. So we have 2 times the susceptibility times the intensity of the magnetizing field times the difference in the angles, the subtended angles, and we get 16.94 nanoteslas, call it 17 nanoteslas. So uh, remember when we did this, assuming, you know, using the um, horizontal cylinder as a simple geometrical object to represent this wall, we came up with 18 nanoteslas, approximately 18 nanoteslas. So one nanotesla less. So let's take a look at that. The, Horizontal cylinder, the anomaly that we got with the horizontal cylinder as a function of x to either side of a point directly over the center of the cylinder. These values of x are measured relative to the point of symmetry. Turned out to be 18 nanoteslas, and, and we've just pointed out that that's one nanotesla larger than what we got assuming that the wall could be represented by this magnetic sheet. Now I would argue that the reason we see a slightly larger anomaly would predict slightly large, a slightly large, larger anomaly is because we're using the horizontal cylinder. It has the same cross-sectional area as the wall. But in collapsing it into this more compact circular shape, we're actually bringing the upper part of the cylinder a little bit closer to the surface. And of course, <clears throat> the bottom of the cylinder is a little bit further away, but I would argue that we're seeing a slightly larger magnetic field intensity over the cylinder because the top of it comes a little bit closer to the surface. So we do see this slight difference in the two anomalies, and um, that would be uh, one possible reason 
that comes to mind for for that difference that we have. Okay, so if we look back here, we have um, for both the sphere that we used and um, we got an anomaly of about 5.4 uh, nanoteslas for the sphere, 18 for the horizontal cylinder. We were computing those anomalies as a function of x, and here you just had to compute the value, the uh, maximum value. Now we can also, uh, back up there a minute, we can also do the same thing with the magnetic field intensity over the sheet of dipoles. <clears throat> so we've got x is equal to zero over here, and we've got kind of an arbitrary x location over here. It's still the same, the problem is still the same. You're, you've got two angles, the angle to the left and the angle to the right for the top, and then you've got the angle to the left and the angle to the right for the base of this of the wall in this case. So we just use that same formula. Um, we have 2i times delta theta. And uh, so it's just a matter of calculating delta thetas at any arbitrary point along the uh, surface. And if we do that, we get this profile that we see here. And you see that it rises up just to about uh, 17 nanoteslas. And this, this is a profile then over the truncated sheet or the wall, however you want to refer to it. Now, I guess a point to emphasize here is we're working with these simple geometrical objects. Remember, we're using them to help us, well, you know, in this case, decide whether we a magnetic survey would actually be something that would be useful for us. Would, would we be able to detect this wall? And we've used three different geometries to do that. Um, the, uh, th I think the ability of you to come up with a reasonable answer using these simple geometrical representations of the geology or of the archaeology in this case uh, is, is really relies on how realistic those choices are. How closely do they correspond to the geometry of the object that you're trying to detect? And we pointed out that the Berger, Sheen, and Jones suggest that you use a sphere to determine, to estimate whether or not the wall might be detectable. And we would argue that, well, a sphere, you know, the wall extends in and out of the screen here. The, the sphere is concentrated in and out of the screen about a point in the center. So it's not really a very realistic approximation to the wall. So if you are using these simple geometrical objects, um, an obvious point, I, I think, but one worth making is that the accuracy of your approximations will really depend on uh, how close the approximations are, the simple geometrical objects are to the actual uh, geology that you're uh, trying to represent. So we're going to talk briefly about the anomaly over a long vertical dipole. And so we're just going to assume that we're standing at the uh, at a point directly over the end of this very long vertical cylinder, let's say. And we're going to start, we're going to go back to the potential. The potential of the dipole would be the uh, pole strength over the distances. So we have a minus sign in here because of our convention that uh, uh, field intensity vectors point into the positive pole and diverge or exit the negative poles. And by convention, we have those downward pointing vectors are negative. So we put a negative sign in there. And the other key issue here is for the vertical, the long vertical dipole is that the positive pole is so far away that r is fairly large compared to r. r plus is fairly large compared to r minus so that we can ignore the contribution from the positive pole which basically gives us the field of uh, the dipole potential of a monopole. So now we could use this as noted over here kind of in this sidebar we could use this to uh, make a reasonable estimate of the magnetic field that you might encounter over a buried well casing or, uh, you know, a geological example would be detecting volcanic pipes, such as a kimberlite pipe. And here's an example in the literature. If you're interested in that sort of thing, you might want to 
take up this article. So the field intensity then, we know that in order to get the intensity, we have the potential. The potential is just the negative derivative of the potential, and that gives us p over r squared. <coughs> Excuse me. And we're after the vertical component here. So we're going to take the cosine of theta, multiply that times p over r squared. In order to get the vertical component of the magnetic field intensity associated with this isolated pole. So we have p over r squared times the cosine of theta. r is equal to x squared plus c squared to the one-half power. x squared plus c squared to the one-half power gives us the uh, hypotenuse. Cosine of theta is just z over r, the side adjacent over the hypotenuse. And we multiply those together, we get that the vertical component of the field intensity is p times z over x squared plus e squared to the 3 halves power. Now we did this before with the, and this should start looking familiar to you, this is uh, uh, the field of a, a monopole, whether it's a gravitational monopole or a magnetic monopole, turns out to be the same, not surprisingly. Of course we have a different term here in the numerator. <coughs> We've got the pole strength, and we remember that the pole strength is equal to the area times the susceptibility times the intensity of the magnetizing field. The area in this case is just the area of the circular cross-section of the cylinder, or pi r squared. So we pull all these terms out, the pi r squared kf sub e. Uh, we do have a z up here. We're pulling a z cubed out of this expression. So the, one of the z's cancel out, so we end up with pi r squared kf sub e over z squared times 1 over x squared over z squared plus 1 to the 3 halves power. Now this term I think you recognize as we did before. This term has the geometry, the physical properties. And it's multiplied times this term, which has we're referring to this as the shape term because it describes the shape of the anomaly. And so if we take a look at the ratio of z sub a at any point x to z, z max, we just have 1 over x squared, 1 over the quantity x squared over z squared plus 1 to the 3 halves power. So the field of this long vertical dipole has the same shape as that of the gravitational monopole or the sphere. So, so we, we should end up with the same diagnostic positions, and we do. Um, <clears throat> the diagnostic uh, positions through, uh, I got rid of that two in there, this is two-thirds, uh, x over z, 0 0.46, 0 0.557, 0 0.766, the depth index multipliers, 2.174, 1 1.795, 1 so these should look familiar to you, they're the same depth index multipliers that we had with the gravitational field that we would see over a buried sphere or point-like uh, object, call it, a, call it a monopole if you want. So I leave you with this problem. We have an anomaly that looks like this. And so it has this symmetrical shape. So we ought to be able to find the points where the anomaly drops off to 3 quarters, 2 thirds, 1 half of its maximum value. And so we're going to leave you with this problem here, but ask you if you notice anything different about it. Um, take a look at the distances along the x-axis. So take as a problem here, uh, determine the depth of the top of the casing for the next time, and we'll come back and talk about that then. Uh, thanks for joining us, and talk to you, talk to you later.